Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with your Aerospace Structure Series. This is the second part of our first lecture in statics, and this is going to study out Newton's laws, his first, second, and third laws, and a quick look at his law of gravitation. Let's see how it works. So first, Newton's first law states that the resultant force on a particle is zero, or if the resultant force on a particle is zero, then that particle remains at rest. Or if it happens to be moving at constant velocity, then that continues to move at constant velocity. So the resultant forces on a particle, or actually anything, is zero, then it remains at rest. Let's see how that works. Well, let's say we have a particle, and if we have, uh, if the sum of forces are equal to zero, so we'll see that the force on one side acting this way is equal to the force on this side acting the other way, the sum of forces is equal to zero, and therefore that particle remains at rest. That means it doesn't move. The same thing is true if it actually happened to be moving at constant velocity, and experiences a balanced set of forces. In that case, the velocity will remain unchanged. Okay, let's take a look at how that actually works. This guy here looks like the sum of the forces on him is zero, hence he remains at rest. This particle is resting soundly. Okay, got that? How about an aircraft example? All right. So another look into Newton's law. If we consider an aircraft flying horizontally at constant speed, and if we study the forces that occur, well, first of all, we're going to have to, for it to be acting at constant speed, that would mean that the thrust is completely balanced by the drag. If this were not true, then it would experience an acceleration. Since it's moving at constant speed, we know that the thrust is just sufficient to overcome the drag. Also, this plane would not be in the air if it didn't have lift forces acting on the wing. So we also find that the lift forces perfectly balance the total weight of the aircraft. So the weight of the aircraft is trying to propel it downward to the center of the earth, and yet the lift forces offset that. Now with aircraft design, we'll find later in other classes, or you've already learned this in probably your 101 class, that the CG in the center of lift can't be at the same point. If they are, your aircraft will be unstable. So you're gonna want that center of gravity a little forward of the center of lift, and then you're gonna get a little tail force that reacts out that moment that, to maintain equilibrium. A lot of times we'll ignore that and we'll just line those two puppies up. For a lot of simple analysis, we can pretend that the center of lift and the weight occur at the same point. We can do preliminary analysis with simple equations that way and later improve our analysis. In that case, we would have our center of lift right at the position of, the, of where the CG is, as we see here. Since our lift is perfectly equal to our weight, we're experiencing no vertical change in velocity, no vertical acceleration. That means it does not move up or down. It just stays essentially at rest. In this case, that rest state is resting vertically and it's acting at constant speed in uh, the horizontal direction. So in both cases, we see the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero, the thrust minus the drag equals zero, hence constant velocity. The velocity is unchanged. If it were sitting on the ground, then it would be remain motionless, right? If the plane is, in, is, is motionless, it will remain motionless. If the plane is moving at constant velocity, it will continue to move at a constant velocity. Also, our weight is perfectly balanced by our lift. Our sum of our forces in the vertical direction say lift minus W equals zero, and since that equals zero, we have no acceleration up or down. We remain at the same position, basically a condition of apparent rest, okay? 
So Newton's second law says that if the resultant force on a particle is not zero, now we saw last, or his first law says if the sum of the forces equals zero, it remains at rest, or actually at constant velocity. Now we're going to look at the case of what if the resultant forces doesn't equal zero. If you sum the forces and they aren't equal to zero, then what happens is that experiences a acceleration. The acceleration is proportional to the mass. F equals ma. The forces equal the mass times acceleration. If your sum of the forces equals zero, it remains with zero acceleration. If your sum of the forces is non-zero, that non-zero is equal to whatever the mass is times the acceleration, which means we can take the sum of the forces, divide by the mass, and we'll know what the acceleration is. The same direction as the force. Okay? If we have this particle and we apply a force to it, and uh, uh, one force is larger than the other, then we can see we sum these forces in the horizontal direction. We find out they don't sum to zero. Hence, it's going to be equal to ma, and we're going to get an acceleration equal to that, that imbalance. Okay. Another way to say this is that the resultant force on a particle is proportional to the time rate of change of momentum, or the sum of forces equals m change in velocity. Well, change in velocity is just another word for acceleration. We will study out that principle in dynamics. Actually, we'll study out the sum of forces equal to ma in dynamics as well. This is not a statics principle. This is a dynamics principle. We have an entire class on that. This class is going to focus on the cases when our sum of the forces equals zero. Now, that doesn't mean that our particle is moving, even that it's not experiencing acceleration, but it means that we're going to be studying the conditions of motion as if it were at constant flight, and that makes things a lot simpler. Let's take a look at example. Let's go back to our little kitty example. He was sleeping so peacefully because the sum of the forces on him were zero. In fact, it looks like they're still, still zero. However, there's a new professor in town, and when he pops up, the sum of the forces ain't zero, and that cat is gone. He experiences an acceleration that's proportional to the imbalance of force. Got that? Sum of forces was no longer zero, and hence that guy experienced acceleration. Okay, if we look back at our example of flight, we had constant speed flight before, and we had the thrust was completely balanced by the drag, and our lift was completely balanced by the weight. However, if we now put our pedal to the metal and apply a larger thrust, that puppy is going to accelerate in the horizontal direction. Our sum of the forces in the horizontal direction was no longer zero, and so that aircraft accelerates. Got that? Pretty simple. Okay. Newton's third law says the forces of action and reaction have the same magnitude, the same line of action, and opposite sense. The forces of action and reaction, which means one force is being applied and another one is reacting it. What this is basically doing is applying Newton's first law. His first law said if the sum of the forces equals zero, the thing remains at rest. Therefore, anytime we evaluate a structure at rest, imposing a statics solution on it, when we sum forces, they're going to have to sum to zero. Because of that, whatever active forces we apply or external forces will be completely balanced by the reaction. That's what this says. The idea of action-reaction pairs. We have a force applied. We're trying to figure out what is the reaction on the supports of the structure. We sum our forces in the various directions, and the resultant forces will be perfectly balancing. They will have the same magnitude, the same line of action, and opposite sense. We have a sum of forces that's in the x direction, we'll get a negative x reaction. If we have a sum of force in the vertical direction, we're going to get a vertical reaction that completely balances. Later, we'll find out, we'll be looking at moments, we'll find out that a moment is also perfectly balanced. This is applying a static solution. It's called imposing equilibrium on the structure. Now, we can look at static equilibrium, where the sum of the forces equals zero. 
That's what we're going to do in statics class. In dynamic in equilibrium, when the sum of the forces is non-zero, which means we're getting acceleration, and that's our dynamics class. After you pass this class, you'll go on to that one. Two separate studies of the same idea, Newton's first and second law. So this basically says when we want to evaluate a structure, we can impose equilibrium. Since we're going to look at it as a static solution, that means our sum of the forces equal to zero. That means that the forces of action and reaction have the same magnitude, same line of action, opposite sets. So if we drive that idea home, if we have this particle and we apply force to it, we know the reaction on that. We can sum the force in the x direction. We can find that the reaction on that is going to have to be a force with the same magnitude, same line of action in opposite sense or opposite direction. Got that? Okay. We're going to be using this all through the class to solve structures, both internal and external forces. That's, we already said that. Sum of forces and moments will always sum to zero. We can sum forces to zero to determine external reaction and internal forces. We'll be looking at that in coming lectures. The whole class is on that, okay? Well, let's look at an example to drive this principle home. An example of Newton's third law. If you talk sweet, you're going to get sweet. Pretty simple. Action, reaction. Same magnitude, same direction, opposite sense. It's so beautiful, little man. However, if you talk mean, you'll get mean. Forces of action and reaction have the same magnitude, same line of action, opposite sense. You can try this on your date tonight. Sit there and talk sweet for about 10 minutes and reap the love. And then turn it bad. Tell her something smells bad or something looks bad or something should be different. And you'll be here. Welcome to marriage. <laughs> All right. Newton's law of gravitation. What this says is that two particles that have mass will be mutually attracted by equal and opposite forces. Two particles that have mass are going to experience attraction that is proportional to their masses. If we write this in an equation, we'll write it like this. The force of attraction is equal to a gravitational constant G times the mass of the one times the mass of the other divided by the distance between the centroids of those or the center of gravities of those squared. Pretty simple. The force of attraction of any two masses is going to be the mass of one times the mass of the other divided by the distance between them squared from center to center times the gravitational con constant. We can solve all kinds of cool problems using this principle. What this means is uh, the more mass that's there, the more attraction that will be experienced. Let's take a look at how this principle works in the example. What this actually means is these folks will experience a lot more attraction than those folks. The more mass, the more attraction. The less mass, the less attraction. You can actually test this out by going up to somebody and get kind of close and just kind of close your eyes and feel the love. Then get a little closer and you're going to feel even more love. Right? Because the closer you are, R squared's in the bottom, the more attraction there is. And the further R, the less attraction there is. Now, if you find that as you approach closer and closer and closer and press yourself tighter and tighter against this other person, if you find yourself actually repulsed rather than being attracted, what that means is something else introduce, is introducing forces that are even stronger than the gravitational forces predicted by this equation. Because this equation is still working. But there might be another force at work that actually is even greater. Okay. So, you guys have been armed. 
you understand Newton's first, second, and third law, and a rudimentary understanding of his law of gravitation. We're going to apply this in some simple problems before moving on into our next lecture where we start drilling down on what all this stuff really means and how do we solve cool structures and solve the mysteries of the universe with Newton's laws. Enjoy.